the benefit of going into a franchise is that, like Paul said earlier, the solutions are already laid out for you. So you already know which route you're going to go. You already have the menu that's already, you know, been through the trial and error process and perfected. You've already been through the marketing piece of it. Um, and you know what to expect. You know what vendors you're going to use and you don't have to worry about those things. But I will say if you're going to embark on any type of business, just knowing in the landscape of what it is that you're about to embark on and, you know, having a cushion. So if you're trying to open up a business and you're crunching your numbers and you're giving yourself a hundred and fifty thousand dollar room to get the business open, you still better equate for operation costs and um, the incidental costs. And that may be six months worth of rent if you could have it to the side, um, four months worth of salary if you can have it to the side, and just other incidentals that you don't know that you're going to run into. You know, you got to be prepared to run through those things. You're listening to the Black to Business Podcast, an educational podcast providing Black entrepreneurs with the tools and resources to start and grow their businesses. We chat with vetted Black entrepreneurs, thought leaders, and business owners as they provide tips and resources to help take your business to the next level. I'm your host, Monique T. Marshall. Hey, hey, and welcome back to the Black to Business Podcast. I am truly excited about today's episode because this is episode one. Hundred, one zero zero zero. Well, one no one zero zero. We made it, and you helped us make it happen because you continue to show up and continue to listen to us. Lets us know that we are doing something right, and it's also a sign for us to keep going. So we're here, we're happy, and we're happy that you are here celebrating with us. Now, I want to ask a quick favor for you to help us celebrate our one hundredth episode. Can you either write us a review on Apple Podcasts and let us know how much you're enjoying this podcast and why, or tag us on Instagram at Black to Business sharing the same sentiments. Either way, we want to know what you think. Now that I've done my shameless plug, let's dive into what today's episode is about. So today I'm chatting with Paul Roberson and Ahmed Jerome, who are two of the three founders of the Sobo Cafe franchise in Brooklyn. And we're chatting all about how to buy into an existing franchise. As we explore more ways to continuously educate our audience here at Black to Business, we're totally aware of the fact that there are many ways to do business. So with that being said, going the franchise route is definitely a different way of doing business. Essentially, as you'll hear in today's conversation with our guests, this route is great for a person who likes to follow established rules and systems. They want to own their own business but are not prepared to start it from scratch and would rather pay a franchisee fee to be allowed to operate using someone else's business system. So we thought it would be great to have someone like Paul and Ahmed on the show who have been very successful franchisers to share their journey and expertise. During our conversation, we're diving into what a franchise is and how it works, the differences between franchising and the traditional business model, and some of the pros and cons of each, and also how to know what franchise model is right for your business and some of the things you should consider before starting a franchise. And lastly, some of the common mistakes made and how to avoid them, because we want to make sure that if you're going this route, that you are doing it right. So without further ado, let's dive into the conversation. So today I have with me the lovely founders of Sobo Cafe here in New York, Mr. Paul and Ahmed. Welcome to the Black to Business Podcast. Thank you for having us. Of course. So first, I'd like to always start by if you all could just introduce yourselves and tell us a little bit about what you do in your business and how did you all kind of like meet and kind of get where you are today. Okay. Well, my name is Paul Roberson. I'm one of the owners and operators of Sobel bed in Sobel Williamsburg. So we've invested in the franchise and we have uh, two locations, the only locations in the Brooklyn market for that particular franchise. Um, I have a business background, uh, attended St. John's University and worked in banking for a time. So I've worked in sales, banking, uh, finance, and dabbled in real estate as well, too. Um, 
like in addition to that, also I've done uh, some um, pre- presentation work as well too. And uh, how we got, how we came to be involved in Sobel is our, our third business partner. Uh, like initially brought the idea to us uh, for us to invest in it. And I'll kick it off to AJ. Um, how everybody calls me AJ, I'm Ahmed Jerome. Uh, my background is also in finance, uh, real estate, some other business ventures um, that we have. Uh, Sobel came to be because it was brought to us by our other business partner, Tony, who was trying to get involved in a franchise. And um, the conversation just grew into the three of us getting to the place where we looked into it, decided that you know, it was a good opportunity and something for us to do and bring to our community um, mm-hmm. here in Bedford-Stuyvesant, especially the underprivileged, like the black and brown community with the healthy eating. And, you know, we jumped on the opportunity to get involved in a, in a growing brand and we're here. I love it. So today's conversation is so exciting because you all, like you mentioned, you bought into a franchise and also the fact that this is a a different route um typically what we talk about on the podcast but i know my audience is interested in hearing more about this so i always like to break it down so that a fifth grader can understand if either of you could just kind of describe what a franchise is before we dive into the conversation of like building a business on a franchise model sure so uh typically when it comes to franchising the the franchisor will start an operation and it literally could be in, it, in anything there's franchises when it comes to literally any type of business or industry that you could possibly think of. So typically what will occur is like when, when the franchisor will experience some success, a quicker way of growth would be to franchise as opposed to, mm-hmm. as opposed to actually owning and operating each individual store. The franchisor may say, well, you know what? Hey, you know, I have experience in this given field. I know what it takes to, you know, make a business successful. I can actually kind of make a model for other people to follow and then they could run the operation themselves. And in return, mm-hmm. I get a percentage of whatever it is that they do. So that's that's essentially what franchising is. You set up the system. The system is ready made for you to operate the business. And then mm-hmm. you, you as the franchisor would then give the franchisees, the people who are buying into the franchise, uh, support to help run the business, you know, whether that's training and in, into what it is that you're actually doing, you know, like like most times, most franchisors, they'll have a proprietary system in place that's specific to their operation. So, for example, with McDonald's, you know, they, if you were to buy into a McDonald's, they want to mm-hmm. see you make the Big Mac a certain kind of way. They want to see you make the chicken nuggets a certain kind of way, whether you're having McDonald's in New York or California or China or France. No matter where it is, it needs to taste the same. So with franchising, you know, no matter what business it is, it needs to operate the same. The experience needs to be the same no matter uh, no matter the location where it is, whether you're here, there or everywhere. It doesn't matter. It's supposed to be the same no matter where it is. Well explained. Love it. So getting into you all kind of talked about your startup journey, I want to dive into that a little bit further into what was that startup process like for you diving into this? And then also, how did you know that this route was better for you versus, say, a traditional business model or creating your own franchise? Um, So the reason why we decided to I'll give you a little bit about our journey, our journey. Okay. Um, was it was an interesting one. It was one of difficulty being um, trying to start a, a, a new business and trying to find funding to start a new business. We had mm-hmm. to dig deep in our pockets and start our business and cash fund our business um, because in the communities that we are in for startup businesses, there's little to no options for financing, especially in the black and brown communities and the underserved communities in which we wanted to open our business. So when you're going into these locations, into these banks and these zip codes, even though they have the Community Reinvestment Act where there's no redlining, where they're supposed to be lending into the communities in which the banks operate, 
you find it still very difficult, even if you check all of the boxes. Um, with we, we had good credit. We had enough assets of cash in the bank. Um, we had enough assets, you know, um, in, in real estate. And they still find ways to deny us the opportunity of lending um, for funds. So we had to basically just do it ourselves when we tried to start an investment group with some like-minded individuals. We tried to pull as many people that look like us that had financial resources so that we can um, get an investment group and share some of the risk and the responsibilities. And the goal was to own many different franchises and split it amongst the, the ownership group. But unfortunately, it's hard to find like-minded individuals who do want to invest in restaurants. And if they do want to invest in restaurants, if they are, you know, black or brown, the most restaurants that we're um, diving into are like uh, Jamaican restaurants or real greasy soul food restaurants, nothing with, with a health benefit. So it's hard to try to cultivate something when people are afraid of change or something new and that you know it, it was difficult but it was a well well traveled journey um if we had to do it over again i would still do it i'll still do it the same way um you know our choice to bring this to this community like i said we as black and brown people we don't eat healthy we don't understand the benefits of healthy living but mm-hmm. the preservation of life if what COVID has not showed you is that life is not guaranteed to do mm-hmm. anything that you could to, you know, eat healthy, to try to preserve that life. And we embarked on this journey, you know, prior to COVID. And we decided to put our restaurant in the middle of fast food row next to the McDonald's and the I and the, and the Burger Kings and the Popeyes and, and, and all of the fried chicken places that are over here in the Jamaican mm-hmm. restaurant. We're like the only healthy restaurant sitting in the middle of all of that. And we've, opened up in the pandemic and we're still here a year and a half later, you know, still kicking, still screaming. And that's just a testament to the community wanting something different. Love it. And for people who are listening, just kind of explain what Sobel is, um, what do you all serve and a little bit about the business. So Sobel, um, uh, Sobel, they first opened up their first locations back in 2014. So uh, mm-hmm. they serve uh, healthy, ready-to-made acai and fruit bowls and smoothies primarily, which is a huge growing market. If you notice, like acai is starting to be offered like kind of everywhere. Like even if you go into your grocery store, there's like an acai flavored Coca-Cola drink now just to show you like how big the, you know, that particular industry has become. So right now, uh, they've been franchising for about, I want to say, like about seven years now. They have 60 locations uh, across six states. Uh, They're founded in Long Island, where they're primarily located. But again, they have locations in uh, Brooklyn, for example, where we're the only franchises operating for the time being. They have a few in Queens, some in Staten Island. There's some in Massachusetts, Connecticut, a couple in Florida. They have one in California. So as of right now, I believe their store count is about a, about 64 locations and growing. I know that they're going to be opening up in the North Carolina market. Um, wow. I believe there's uh, plans for them to open somewhere like in the Atlanta market as well, too. So they're uh, they're a rapidly growing location. Uh, um, they're, they're rapidly growing brand where uh, I, we can definitely see them uh, growing uh, pretty quickly in location count, you know, pretty fast. And so, AJ, you spoke about some of the the difficulties in the initial process, especially looking at it from a t- traditional route. I want to talk about the preparation in terms of, OK, getting to the point where you're ready to open your doors for someone who's listening that may want to go this route. What are some of the things that they should have before they even open or consider going this route? Proper financing and a proper plan and a and a good team. The benefit of going into a franchise is that, like Paul said earlier, the solutions are already laid out for you. So you already know which route you're going to go. You already have the menu that's already, you know, been through the trial and error process and perfected. You've already been through the marketing piece of it. um, And you know what to expect. You know what vendors you're going to use and you don't have to worry about those things. But I will say, if you're going to embark on any type of business, just knowing in the landscape of what it is that you're about to embark on and, you know, having a cushion 
So if you're trying to open up a business and you're crunching your numbers and you're giving yourself a hundred and fifty thousand dollar room to get the business open, you still better equate for operation costs and um, the incidental costs. And that may be six months worth of rent if you could have it to the side. Um, four months worth of salary, if you can have it to the side and just other incidentals that you don't know that you're going to run into, you know, you got to be prepared to run through those things. And when you're dealing with franchises in New York city, there's so many different laws that you don't know exists and you don't know where to find them because this information isn't readily available to you when you're opening up your company and you're creating your LLC and you can just Google what laws do I need to follow as a franchise, as a, as a restaurant, because all laws are different. And New York City is kind of set up for the small business man to fail, so to speak. So you really don't know that these laws exist. So you need to hire a good lawyer or retainer. That's number one, a good employment lawyer and have them on retainer. But ask them as many questions as you possibly can about the New York city laws, which is different from the New York state laws and like places in Long Island where our franchise is located, they don't follow the same boundaries. And even though we're, we're, we're as a franchise, right. You start your own business and you buy into the franchise. So you're your own location, but the way that New York city writes the law, you're a part of a chain so they hold you to these specific laws that as a small business owner, it could really cripple you. Um, and, you know, be careful with the hiring. Be careful of just placing people because you're in the need to open your doors. So you have to be heavily financed because if you just place people in your stores, you won't have a business because if you don't place the right people in there, you know, a lot of malicious intent can happen behind it. And we're sheltered from a nine to five um, when you work for a Fortune 500 company and you're getting paid those salaries. You don't realize the cost that goes into really running a business. And until we embarked upon this journey, uh, when you have to take on 100 percent of the financial risk to it, you understand it in a, in a, in a different mindset where, I, I mean, down to the receipt paper, down to the napkins, the straws, um, handing them out to customers, the bags. You, you're like, how many how many napkins did you give that customer? Because that comes mm-hmm. from your pocket and your employees don't understand because it doesn't come from their pocket. But you as a small business owner, you would literally have to equate for everything that you buy. You know what I'm saying? So mm-hmm. you have to have a plan. You have to understand the plan. You have to understand understand the landscape of the environment that you are in. You need to understand your demographics. And it's hard to even understand how to market to your demographic, you know, and you need to have all of this figured out before you even have that first step of spending that money. And I think that's where a lot of people go wrong because you think that, okay, the solution is tailor-made, but if Mm -hmm. you're introducing a uh, old product to a new market, it's a new product to that market in which you're introducing it to. So you're really going from scratch and from zero where you have to introduce this product to people who don't know that it exists. So even though we're a part of 64 stores, when we opened up our store in Williamsburg, that community wasn't familiar with the brand in which we were trying to launch. So we have to really go outside and do grassroots um, marketing to really get the people to come into our stores. And that can be giving out samples, touching every customer, standing outside, shaking the hands, giving out flyers in the community. You really have to go through those grassroots or your business is going to fail. So many great points in there and kind of off. But I was just out this weekend speaking of the napkins and I went to a couple of restaurants and I'm like, why don't they give napkins? And then one I mean, they gave some, but it was such a small amount. Then one gave a lot. And I'm like. Mm, Black people, restaurants, they know, give us a lot of napkins. (laughs) But just thinking about, like you said, that cost, uh, the customer is not understanding that. So glad you kind of. And 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 not even to mention through COVID, everything Mm -hmm. is up. And especially because we're at war and a lot of the supply chains are cut off. The cost of plastic is up. Sometimes customers come into the store and they say, hey, can I get a cup of plastic? 
a, a, a water, you know, can I get a plastic cup of water and some ice? And I'm like, if you bring your own cup, I can give you some <laughs> ice. But the, the, the cost of plastic is what, what we was paying $74 for. Um, we're now paying $124 uh. for when it comes to these cups, you know, and we haven't raised our prices to pass that cost on to the community. We kind of just eat it, you know, mm-hmm. in, in a sense. So it's definitely something that you definitely have to be mindful for because the cost of paper goods are up, the cost mm-hmm. of plastic goods are up, you know, the cost of fruit is up and we have to make those hard decisions sometimes when we're buying fruit because the fruit market is like the stock market where it changes daily, especially in a fresh fruit game when when you think in last year we were getting fresh strawberries for ten dollars a flat and this year it went as high as fifty four dollars a wow. flat for the same strawberries. It's like we're making the same bowls, we're giving out the same quantity, but our customers didn't feel that uptick in price. Mm-hmm. And we still have to give our percentage to the franchise after we get a cut. And we still have to pay our staff and we have to make those decisions like when they ask for extra strawberries, unfortunately, we can't give extra strawberries today, you know, because of the price of it. So if you go in under finance and don't understand the type of business that you're getting into to understand that the, the, the products change, the price changes. And now how do you make that work in your community when your rent is going up? You know, Mm -hmm. the cost of fruit is going up, the cost cost of plastic is going up, the cost of electricity is going up, and you're trying to keep your doors open at a price point that's reasonable, and you have some customers saying, like like you said, hey, can I get some more of these things? And sometimes as a Mm -hmm. small owner, you're like, oh, Jesus, because when we go to work and we're a nine to five and we're an office manager for you know, any Fortune 500 company, when they say order paper, you're going to order 10, 15 Mm -hmm. rolls of paper because it's not your money. But over here, when it's time for us to order paper, we're like, make sure you get one box, one Mm -hmm. box of of paper. You know, we're going to we're going to order as many packs of granola as we need. You know what I mean? We don't over over to make sure that there's no waste because we're not at the point yet where where we're making money, right? We're just at the point where the business is trying to sustain and trying to run itself. And sometimes we we miss our mark in what it is that we're trying to do. And us as small business owners, we have to dig in our pockets and put our lives on hold to make sure that at the end of the week, you know, our employees work hard and they're expecting a paycheck. And if the business doesn't do the numbers that it was supposed to do, we don't tell our our employees, well, unfortunately, we can't pay you. No, we put our lives on hold and Mm -hmm. we decide to not go on trips, not to buy houses, you know, not to live our lives and take the money out of our own pockets and continue to pour, you know, into our 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 network, you know. So it, it there's just tough decisions, you know, that have to be made all around. But you know, this is just the price of doing business. No one asked us to to open up this business. It was a decision that we embarked on. So we're trying to, you know, hold steady to it. But, you know, there's just so many moving parts to it that you don't even begin to understand that how difficult it may be for that business to give you those napkins, you know, especially Mm -hmm. if the community isn't supporting them the way that they need to be supported. You know, maybe it cost them 42 thousand dollars a month to run their business but they're only making you know thirty eight thousand dollars a month or maybe they're only making thirty four thousand dollars a month how do they keep those businesses open when they still have to you know provide and 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 buy things and, and keep it open so something as little as a fork you know for a small business could be you know it, it could be huge. Like, oh my God, you guys are throwing that away. Like, you know, we have to give out samples to customers and we're giving spoons away. We're giving those sample cups away. Mm-hmm. Let's put them to eat and throw into the garbage. And that's just, I count it as, oh my God, that's about 35 cents. This customer, you know, 35 cents. That customer, oh my God, that's 50 cents. But it's a part of the marketing and, and that's how you get the brand out. So, you know, it's just, you know, things to think about. Yeah, all of those things, the financials, and yeah, and I was also charged 20 cents for a cup this weekend, too. Just to put that out there. Um, yeah, I mean, but, but, now may, but now maybe you'll understand where that 20, that 20 cents, yeah. 
you may have no problem paying it now before you'll be like, oh my God, they want to charge me for a cup. That definitely was. Yeah, I mean, you don't know what those small business owners are going through or what it takes for them to, you know, to get that cup because it can be a lot. I can tell you, you know, sometimes we've made tough decisions where it's like, do I pay my mortgage or do I pay my staff? You know what I mean? Mm. And you have to make that decision. And that's a tough decision to tell your wife or your your husband or your girlfriend, whoever it is. Hey, sweetheart, we're going to be late on the bills because I need to pay my staff and make sure that, you know, they're taken care of. Those are difficult conversations to tell your children. Hey, I know that you wanted this for your birthday, but unfortunately, Mm -hmm. I have to take care of the business before in hopes that eventually we can get to you know, the promised land where I won't have to do this or going away for a birthday wouldn't, wouldn't be so financially feasible, but, you know, sacrifices. Yeah, definitely. And one of the things mentioned was that the it's important to build a solid team. So you all are, it's three founders. Um, talk about some of the shared responsibilities and how do you determine who does what? Is it like you delegate or one person focuses on this area? Like, how do you break that down, especially when it comes to man- managing your franchise? What we do is we just play to each other's strengths, really. Um, mm-hmm. That's the biggest thing that you can do is play to each other's strengths and get out of each other's way. If you can do that and, and put your ego to the side, right, and understand mm-hmm. that. And that's the difficult part because we've been through our ups and downs and we've been through our share of hard conversations that Mm -hmm. we have to have with one another. But if you have an understanding of, okay, why is this person having this hard conversation with me? And you're able to understand that they're having this conversation because they want to see the business succeed. Right. Mm -hmm. I I tell my business partners all the time. That, you know, my job as the, the the operator of the overall infrastructure is I have a fiduciary responsibility to do what's right by the business at all times. So even if I have to de- deliver a message that you don't like, right, or mm-hmm. if I have to coach you because you're doing something wrong or in an area I see opportunity at, I'm going to do that because my fiduciary responsibility is to the business to make sure that. I'm doing right by the business at all times. And that may not be what's right for AJ. That may not be what's right for Paul. That may not be what's right for Tony. And we have to find a ways to not take it personal and to move forward. And, you know, we had to work through those, those opportunities, you know, and get into know each other when everyone wants to say so, because it's like, well, it's my business too. And I understand it, but we have to play to each other's strengths. Like, are you equipped, you know, to run the business? Are you equipped to build a business? You know, are you equipped to as detail orientated as I am in doing the paperwork? So, you know, we have an infrastructure where, you know, me and Paul um, do all the paperwork. So even if it's my responsibility this time to do the paperwork, I hand it off over to him. You know, he makes sure that he files it, stores it, you know, whenever we need it, um, he'll be able to pull it up. He'll be on the emails corresponding with our third party, you know, looking at our accounts to make sure that, you know, we're getting the deposits in how we're supposed to. Once we get those deposits in, you know, I'm moving them in places that we need to do. Um, You know, he's writing checks to to the people that they need to be written to to make sure that our bills are paid and, and and I'm covered. And then when he can't Um, do that, then I jump on board and do that as well. And I'm making sure that the payroll is paid, that all of the fruit ordering is on point to make sure that the stores are fully stocked. You know, the liaison between the franchise and the employees, between um, the franchise and our management team to make sure that we're scheduling properly, that we're hiring properly, you know, looking at the business in a very minute standpoint from the financial standpoint. You know, that's Mm -hmm. what I do. Um, and all of the day to day running and our other business partner, he's the builder. So he has the construction background. So he makes sure that the place is built, that the place isn't falling apart, that um, we're up to code and to make sure that we're not lacking in a place in an environment where people walk into and they're like, oh, my God, I will never eat here. You know mm-hmm. what I'm saying? Um, and our uh, staff shares in a responsibility that too, like we clean our store daily. Uh, one of the franchise, when they do come and they do audit us, they say for a store that's been open almost two years, 
I'm surprised that you guys are this clean. You know, and we pride wow. ourselves on that. We clean our stores every single night where we're wiping down freezers, we're right, we're wiping down walls, we're mopping, we're bleaching our rags that we use at the end of every night, you know, so like we're wiping our honey jars. Like we're 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 going to the max just to make sure that, you know, when the health department comes in here, we're on point and that's why we got an A, you know, with no findings uh so quickly. You know, so it's just a part of what we take pride in and presenting black excellence because we were the first. We're not the only at this point. I believe there's one other minority franchise owner, but we were definitely the first um, minority franchise owners of, you know, black people in this business, you know, and it was difficult because when you're the first of something, when something doesn't go wrong, we definitely been the blame as to why things are changing because those yeah. guys did this and it didn't work and you know so you know you deal with a lot so just to you know trying to cross all your t's and dot your i's and understanding that you have to be better than your peers you know because of the color of your skin is a very difficult thing but it's a thing that's relevant in our minds and we understand that we have to be better. We understand that if we do something wrong, if we make an error in this business, we didn't make an error because we're human. We made an error because we're black and, you know, and we're judged upon that. So we pride ourselves on being better, you know, and I talk to my staff at every meeting about being better, being nicer, being mm-hmm. more courteous, um, smiling more like these are the, like these are non-negotiable factors because you guys have to be better. We're trying to teach young people to be black professionals. And it starts here. Right. If it's not going to start in your household, it's definitely going to start here. Take pride in your appearance. You know, we don't let our staff members come in. If their clothes are sloppy, if their shirt is wrinkled, if their shirt has stains on it, you know, you can't service our customers like that. You have to be presentable at all times. And that's not a corporate thing. That's a that's a bedside thing. You know, that's an AJ, Tony, Paul and even our manager, Jacoby thing. Like we pride Mm -hmm. ourselves on just being better and trying to let people know that professionalism will be maintained at all times. Yes, I love that. And congratulations to you all for being the first. That is a major accomplishment. And um, I ask that question because for someone who's listening, they're thinking, can I go at this alone? If they can, what are some of the first people that they should look to get on their team? So if you all could just answer. They can't. (laughs) Okay, why not? So they need a partner? Well, not not that they can't finance it alone, right? So you know, as a person who's in the store a lot and, you know, talks to the staff and hear the staff, the one message that I'm constantly delivering to them is that this is your business too, right? I get that me, Paul and Tony financed the business, right? And we built it, but you guys are here with us from the ground up, from the trenches, building a brand. And this is your store too. So take pride in the fact that this is your store, right? Take pride in the fact that you're being a part of um, grassroots of building a business from the beginning. Pay attention so that when it's time for you to open your own business, you'll see all of the trials, the tribulations that we go through and take notes in it. But you can't do anything in this world and be successful on your own, you know, unless you're at the craft table and you just hit the seven and, you know, you, you make a, a, a whole bunch of money. But in order to build something of this magnitude, no, you need you need a You need a strong stable. And even with us, when it came to, you know, our day to day, even though I am here in assisting in the, in the day to day running of the business, we had to hire an outside manager who has a different outlook. And that was, you know, my mission for building this staff is that we need someone who will be able to look at this business for what it is and not be so emotionally involved or emotionally mm-hmm. invested in the business. And they'll be able to make sounder decisions because yeah, if some, if one of our employees are in here and they're messing up, 
it may be $15 an hour to them or $16 an hour to them or $17 an hour to them. But to us, this is a half a million dollar investment, you know, that we put forth in this one location. So if this doesn't work, then this is our hopes, our dreams, you know, our families, our kids' livelihood going down the drain. So we are much more emotionally invested in it. And it was, we needed to have like that clear cut person who can see things from, um, you know, clear lenses where they're fully detached from it and they can make sound decisions to help us stay grounded. And we couldn't do that alone. So understanding and thinking that you can do something like this by yourself, you would, it's a recipe for disaster. It's a recipe for failure. So you have to share in the load. You have to share the praises of your successes with your team, because I guarantee you, you can't do it all. I've had the pleasure of working in a store one day by myself because uh, we had uh, death in, in, in one of the employees' family and we just opened up the business and we didn't have the proper staffing. And I was in the store, you know, by myself working where I had to have a family member, hey, just sit in this store with me so that I'm not alone. And they watched me work for 12 hours and they said, I'm tired for you. So I know wow. that it's a lot. And I know that this isn't sustainable for one person to do alone. Like you, no one man can do this job by themselves. You need a team and you need a great team. Mm. Well, yeah, that's and when I also speaking alone, um, you know, making sure that someone can go into buying into a franchise alone, not to say like just building. Of course, they have to build a team. Um, but I guess the 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 fact that encouraging them, would you say that they can found it? Well, go into buying alone. I mean, you. De- I mean, you definitely can. It, it, it depends on the business and what they're looking to do, and how fast the business owner are looking to scale. To be honest with you, you know, mm-hmm. for, like again, fran- uh, franchising is an effective growth tool because you can grow faster franchising than you know opening up each individual location yourself. Typically, that's normally been the case, you know. Mm-hmm. And also, it takes a lot of the overhead out of the hands of out of your hands of having to build each individual location. If I can say. Hey, you know, I want to, you know, I want to scale my business. And right now I have five. I've been able to build this up and I have five locations, but I would love to see my business get to 500 locations. But then I can go, well, hey, let me give up a piece of it. And then, but say, hey, maybe I'll get six or 7% of a hundred more locations. And I don't have to finance the construction of each location. And I don't have to worry about architects and expediters and attorneys and so on and so forth. And having to handle each individual payroll of each location. Or I can say, hey, let me pass on some of that responsibility to whoever, you know, would think that this would be a great opportunity for them. I can coach them. I could provide them the support on how uh, on how they can make their particular location a success. So that's one of the, you know, that 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 would be one of the uh, primary benefits to franchising is just is scalability. If it's a successful product, service, system, whatever it may be, I can scale that faster by franchising it as opposed to building out individual locations. But then, you know, it depends on what you're looking for, what the individual business owner might be looking for and looking to do. You know, franchising can be very successful, but, you know, you're still going to, you know, but then you may not want to have your brand diluted. You know, there have been several uh, cases of people buying into franchises and then getting their franchises taken away because they weren't operating them to the standards that the franchise wanted them to. So that's also something to keep in mind. If you buy into it or if you're starting it, you want to remember, you want that burger to tell. Like I said earlier, you want that Big Mac to taste the same no matter if you're in New York, Chicago, Los Angeles, no matter what. The quality has to be there. And, you know, for some, so if you're, if you have something that's near and dear to your heart and you want to scale it, you know, are you able to look at it from such an objective standpoint as to remember, you may look at it this way, but is somebody going to operate it the way you would so that your baby is presented in the way that you want to? I'm going to add on to that. There's nothing wrong. When you look at um, people of other cultures, right, whether it be Chinese, Indian, and, and the African-American community, we don't 
have a sense of community where we're able to pull together. We kind of like have that crab in a barrel effect because crabs are not meant to be in a barrel, Jay-Z once said, right? And because we have that mentality, we're unable sometimes to pull our resources because we don't want to see other people outshine us. So we don't want to see other people do good. But working in banking, I've had the pleasure on helping so many customers and getting their stories from them. Like, how did you start? And you realize that their village really supported them where their whole family pulled their resources together for one person to gain financial wealth. And that one person was able to reach back and grab their hands to pull up another person. And then now they have two locations. And now when two locations are doing good, they can pull two more people in, you know, and open up two more locations. And now those four locations could pull another four in, you know, so we don't do that in our community. So when when one person says, you know, I have the wealth to do this by myself and I'm going to do this by myself, that's what it is. It's by yourself and we don't build our communities by ourselves. So that's the only one problem that I have or that I would say like, hey, if you could do it, you know, fine. I'm always okay with sharing the, you know, sharing the wealth, sharing the load and, and bringing other people on because number one, it's boring when you're balling by yourself. It's more fun when you're doing it with people where you're not res- physically or financially responsible for carrying that load because you're the only person a- around your circle that is rich or the only person in your circle that has money when you're the only person who's able to enjoy life. It's a very selfish mentality and we have to do better as a community to pull each other in. You know, so what we're trying to do here with the three of us is we're OK with sharing our load and sharing our responsibilities. Mm-hmm. And when we've all taken turns, you know, doing different things financially at different times where, you know, it may be my turn to carry the brunt of the load or, you know, it was Paul's turn to start us with the financial brunt of the load, you know, so, and then it was Tony's turn to, to kick in and do the finance part. We all pull in and no matter what, we're all okay with When this thing starts to pay back dividends, you know, Mm -hmm. we're sharing that load because our goal is to build communities. It's not just to build one, you know, just to build self. I love that message. Love that. And Paul, you kind of touched on something about the expectations of being in this space. Uh, What are some of the expectations that people can expect? So like you said, that burger to taste the same, that bowl to taste the same. Like, What are some of the things that they can expect? Maybe it's a pro or con. Uh, Well, with us, as you know, just to touch on AJ's point earlier, you know, like the franchise definitely has high expectations of everybody that's, you know, invested in it and owning and operating it. But, Mm -hmm. you know, with us, we always try to take it a step further. So whatever they hold us accountable for, we kind of two at times 10. So we're 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 very much uh, on our staff and on ourselves to provide the best possible experience when you walk through that door. You know, we you know, we want to greet you warmly and friendly. You know, this is a place, you know, we're in business for the long haul. So we want you to come back. So when you know, when you walk through that door, you know, we always tell our staff. When people come in, you know, it's an experience, you know, you know, someone can make an acai bowl at home, right? They, you know, they can buy the ingredients and, you know, and make it themselves. However, you know, I will admit, you know, it's not going to be as good as what you'll get from us. (laughs) Right. (laughs) But it's not only that, you know, not only are you going to be getting a quality product, but you're also going to be getting a quality experience. You know, one of the things that we're, you know, we've been fortunate to hear is, oh, my God, like, you know, when they come, you know, when people walk through these doors, these bowls are great. I've never tasted anything like it. Or if you have had an acai or a fruit bowl or a smoothie bowl before, it's, oh, I've never had it like this. And the consistency, I keep coming back and expecting it, you know, to drop at a certain point. But, you know, it never does because, you know, like, why is that? Well, it's simple. It's because we use the freshest ingredients. We buy our fruit daily. You know, it's always fresh. So you're always going, it's always going, you know, so that that flavor is always going to come through, whether it's in a bowl or in a smoothie. So when you come to Sobel, uh, Bed-Stuy or Sobel Williamsburg, you're going to get that top flight experience. It's going to be friendly service. If, you, if you're not sure about something on our menu, like AJ said, we're going to allow you to sample it, to try to taste it, to see, you know, if you've never had an acai bowl before, well, hey, 
this is what it tastes like. Hey, let me make you a sample of it so you can, you know, so you can, t- you know, so you can have what it tastes like. Or if you have had one before and you are familiar with it, this is the way that we do it here at Sobel Bed Stuy in Williamsburg. See, see the way that we make it and let us know what you think. So I think just, you know, really having that, you know, like putting the customer first always and just giving them that experience that makes them want to come back and, you know, and dine with us again. Love it. And so before we wrap up, I have to ask about, let's talk about the numbers and the finances as much as you want to give um, when it comes to, of course, we're looking for people who are looking to go into the space, buying into a franchise. Um, If you could just break down, like, what does it look like in terms of finances? Like you mentioned, like paying back the franchisee Mm -hmm. and like, what does that whole breakdown look like in some examples? Well, it's not. I'm going to let Paul jump into a, a little bit, but it's not paying back the franchisees because they don't loan you anything. Uh, it's 100 percent on you. Right. They take a right. It's like a it's like a performance based contract that you sign with them where they take a percentage of whatever mm-hmm. the growth is that you that that you make. Um, and I'll let Paul go into the other part. It, it um, huh. Because it, it, it's 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 kind of challenging to say from the perspective like it depends on your location, right? So mm-hmm. to own and operate a Soul Bowl in Long Island is going to be cheaper to own and operate a Soul Bowl in Brooklyn. Why is that? Simple, because you know the you know your rent in Long Island is going to be cheaper. Your uh your cost of labor is going to be cheaper. It's not as much to you know to pay your staff because like the minimum wage is lower in Long Island versus New York. So the level of insurance that you have to have on your business is cheaper. Right. Exactly. Like your insurance is cheaper outside of the city. So just to give you an idea, the way that you don't use the department of buildings out there. Right. Oh gosh, (laughs) It it goes into so much because like with us, we're going to be at the higher end of the spectrum because I mean, New York city is one of the most expensive places. So just to give you an idea with us, you know, with us, first you have your franchise fee, right? You know, that's what you, you know, that's the fee that you pay the franchise to buy into it to say, Hey, I want to open up a franchise and, and this is the area that I want to open it up in. So you have your franchise fee from there. Then you have to find where you want to rent. Right. Mm-hmm. So then, of course, when you want to rent, you know, you have to worry about your first months, your security deposit, which is four months, you know, which is, you know, <laughs> typically four months in advance that they want. So you have that. Yeah. So, so so you're already at almost, you know, six figures before you even before you've even started construction. And that's where the fun part starts. And then you have to, then, you know, then from there, depending on if it's a first gen space or a second gen. And what that means is if it's a first gen, that means it's never been a restaurant before. It's always more cost effective to go into what's called a second gen space, meaning that it's already it's already designated and it's already being used for what you want to use it for. That's what happened with us at our Williamsburg location. We took over a space that was already used for a similar purpose. So that helped us on the construction side. We didn't have to spend as much as we probably would have converting it to something else. So, and we still spent a pretty penny. Right. And we still <laughs> wound up spending a lot. We still wound up spending well into oh, the six figures. Yeah, over 300000 right. clearly. So, right. Wow. So, then, so then you have to deal with your architects. You have to deal with your expediters. You have to deal with your attorneys, your accountants, and everybody gets a cut. So conservatively speaking, then I you got to buy your material, then you got to buy your right. kitchen, then you got to get your lighting correct, then you have to get your uniforms. Then- and to the specifications <laughs> that the franchise wants, because, again, when you walk into McDonald's, every McDonald's looks like a McDonald's. So every mm-hmm. sobo has to look like a sobo. You have to buy specific tables. You have to buy specific lights. You have to, um, you know, the, your counters have to look a certain kind of way. Your signs have to look a certain kind of way. So that's the, the floors have to right, look right, a the certain floors way. have to look a certain kind of way. That's wow. why registers. right registers have to be certain kind of registers. That's the why TV systems, TV system. systems everything. <laughs> With the franchise, it has to look the same no matter what. That's that's the reason why it becomes so costly because if we were to start up our own thing, I could say, you know, oh, well, I can buy this TV because the TV is fine. It doesn't matter. Mm-hmm. Or oh, I can buy this flooring because Oh, this is going to be cheaper. But it's a franchise, you go. Oh, I'm going to buy this floor. The franchise go. Whoa, hold on a second, Paul. Not so fast. This is the way that it looks in every store. So, here are the options that you have. Pick between that one. So, for us, 
in New York City, especially being in the most expensive market, if you're looking to do something, and remember, this is specific to us, you know, you're dealing with food service and then you're dealing with smoothie and acai bowl shop. Uh, I would probably say, to be honest with you, to be comfortable, I would probably say you're going to be looking anywhere in the 450 to 500 range. And that's with keeping in mind having a cushion mm-hmm. of six months of rent in the stash and having about four to five months of um, a hey, payroll, hey. you know, because you have those expensive expenses that continue. And then on top of that, you want to just have some something something just laying around should whatever emergency before you, because in business, something always does happen. So, you know, I would say something in that range for what we've embarked on would be, you know, and, and, and then you can kind of scale that to where you are. Because again, if you're somewhere else where the, you know, where the real estate is cheaper, you know, you know, like, you know, in New York City, especially if you're in Manhattan or certain parts of Brooklyn, like we are, it's not unheard of for a landlord to say, hey, hey I want to rent your space. And for them to look at you and go, OK, it's $10,000 a month. Mm. You know, well, as opposed to where you may be, you know, in the commercial district, wherever you're located, 2,500 may be the going rate. You know what I mean? So it depends. It really depends. But for us, any anywhere from the 450 to 500 range in New York City would be what, what, what I would say you would want to aim for, to, to you know, to be on the comfortable side. And whatever it is that your franchise, whatever it is that your franchise number is, I would say double it. So if you're looking at your FVD and it's 150,000 in there, double it, right? If it's 200,000 in there, double it because that's just what it is. And you have to now prepare for what's called pandemic um, money Mm -hmm. Um, because we got into this business at the height of pandemic and dealing with the city of New York, which is very difficult. um, And the Department of Buildings will hold your job up, will not approve your permits, and it will cost you thousands of dollars just in delays, you know, if you don't have the proper things in place. And when the pandemic hit, like it did for us, our landlord wanted his money. He didn't care that we wasn't open. He didn't care that Department of Buildings was closed. And we unfortunately had to pay rent in a place that we couldn't open. We couldn't get permits for a year. Uh, we, we paid because when when it when COVID happened and what's that, 2022, February, that February of 2020, we weren't able to get our permit to open. Department of Buildings didn't open their doors back until October of 2020. We weren't wow. able, we had to pay extra money to, to for people to try to get us through faster. And we wasn't able to open our doors until, you know, uh, November of 2020. And we had to pay from February to November, you know, whatever that rent is. So if that rent is $6,000, $7,000 a month, we had to pay that every single month with no returns on our investment, with no hopes of opening up, you know, and that can kill your, that could kill your reserves right there. Cause if you had six months of rent, you just went over six months, just mm-hmm. trying to keep your doors open to try to make the business happen. And and there's no reprieve, nothing that you get back in return from it. It's just money lost in the wash, but it's like the, the cost of doing business. So if you go into any business under finance, just understand that you've already lost the battle. Most businesses don't fail because the idea was bad. The, it fails because they didn't have enough money to make it through so where that the community got it and understood it and it was able to thrive. And that could be a three, four, five year process. Thank you both for, you know, just sharing the inside of your business with our audience. I know people are going to find so much value in that. And it's obvious that, like you said, you all have been able to sustain the business in the midst of COVID. And then you've opened a second location. So you're doing something right. I want to talk about the process of opening the second location. Like, when did you know that that was a great decision and how was that process for you? It was interesting because we were like still... um about to open here actually and COVID mm-hmm. happened and you know we had liked the concept and the brand so much we were saying like you know and, and you know and we kind of had the lay of the land because there were no op- you know there were no franchisees operating in Brooklyn at the time so we kind of had our pick of the locations of where we could go so we kind of thought to ourselves well where would this concept work where would it be good to go to and you know so of course you know the first one was in bed so we said you know we looked at different spots of Brooklyn and you know, we had said, okay, let's, um, you know, let's go to Williamsburg. Let's see what they have out there because, 
you know, anybody that's familiar with Brooklyn knows Williamsburg is one of the hottest areas, you know, not just in Brooklyn, not in, just in the city, yes. just in the country in general, really in the world now, really. So when we initially uh, approached the landlord about where we, where our current location is in Williamsburg, we're at 175 Kent Avenue, right across the street from where the new Trader Joe's just opened, they, um, they gave us a number and we had agreed to it. And we were actually in the process of like, you know, having the lease drafted and having it reviewed by an attorney, but then COVID hit. So mm. everything kind of got put on pause. So then um, a few months passed and, you know, they you know, to, when we initially went to Williamsburg, mm-hmm. it was a no for us because they were asking double the rent of oh, what yeah, it is right, that we're you're paying. Right, you're right, you're so right, we right. actually oh, wow. We actually walked away from that deal yeah. because you're right. the rent was upwards of fifteen thousand dollars a month. Um, to, I can see that in Williamsburg. To you know to be um, in that area and to be on Bedford was about thirty thousand dollars a yes, month. Yes, so when yes, we right, was pursuing right. it. We said there's no way that we could right. afford this and be successful with trying right. to build a brand. No, you're right. He's, and yeah, then when COVID right. hit, um, it kind of worked out in our favors because those landlords reached back out to us like, hey, are you guys is still interested in the space? And our retort was yes, but not for that number. And we kind of threw out a number out there that we just knew that they were going to say no to. And they said yes because mm. of the market that we were in right. and we got the space for, you know, like the half the price of what it was. And now today that the market has recovered, people are there back up to the right. $20,000 <laughs> rents uh, like out there oh, in that God. area. So the, yeah. the bad thing, the good thing and the bad thing is that we were able to get in Williamsburg for the price that we did. The bad thing is that we're paying the price that we're paying to be in Williamsburg because it's not easy to carry that, that load. And, you know, the, the landlords, they want us to fail in there because, you know, we're not out of the pandemic, but we're definitely in a better space and people are paying triple the rents that what we're paying. So they wish that our business fell so that they can rent this space to somebody else and get triple the money for it. You know, they're just waiting yeah. for it. To fail. So, yeah, you know, that's why we have to we got to promote it, guys. We got to be over there in the location. I love Williamsburg area now. So I, 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 love, I love it, too, um, being over there, seeing the opportunities. But it's yeah. That- it's definitely a challenge over there for a, a, a couple of different reasons, but we're gonna yeah. we're gonna work towards um, being over there and 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 having a black business on a strip like Williamsburg, directly across the street from that new Trader Joe's. You don't see any people of color owning businesses on that block, so to get the mm. people to stop in and pull them in, you know, is it's not an easy thing, but it's it's not. It's not met with a lot of resistance, but, you know, it's just a lot of people that walk by it, maybe more so because we're new. And that's why we have to be out there doing that old school guerrilla marketing by grabbing each and every customer to put, try to pull them in just to let them know, like, hey, we're here. We're healthy. We taste good. You know, and it's a it's, it's a different climate from what it is in bed Certainly. Well, this has been so amazing. And this is part of our series for Black men who lead, where we're recognizing, highlighting men like you who are really making waves in our communities and really continue to push our communities forward and also making waves in your business. And I have to ask you all, um, this is such an inspiring interview, how you spoke about doing business together. So I want to ask for each of you, what does it mean for you to be black men doing business together? Oh, I mean, we're trying to break the mold, right? We're trying to break the mold inside of presidents at the same time that mm-hmm. that young black men can pull together and do something positive and do something successful at the same time with educating the community and providing, you know, jobs and trying to stimulate our community. So we have a tremendous sense of responsibility on our shoulders to make Mm -hmm. this succeed, you know, and we've done it on our own. I'm, I'm glad to say that, you know, we've reached out to our community leaders to help us when we were struggling, trying to open the business. And unfortunately, they didn't have enough time for us because at the time they were running campaigns, you know, and Mm -hmm. they were definitely here for the photo ops opportunity when we opened. 
but we did everything on our own with the support of the community and the support of our family and friends, you know, without the support of, you know, our, you know, of, you know, like, like our delegates or what, what, what we call them, like the, the councilman that, yeah. that's mm-hmm. leader of the small business um, community, like Carnegie was the leader of the small business community and the councilman at the time. We reached out to him on a number of occasions to just help us out with permitting, you know, being new to the community, but also being from the community. Like I was born in this community. I went mm-hmm. to school in this community. I went to 258. You know, my mom taught at Boys and Girls. I was, you know, one of the management uh, members of the, the local TD bank, you know, in the community. And then to open up a business in the community and provide jobs, you know, for the people and just not get the help and not get the support and not get the, you know, the 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 level of accountability in which other people who open businesses in our community during the same time but we just didn't have the cachet that some people did as far as the TV press behind them where they were able to get their business open in three weeks, which mm. it, it took us almost nine, seven, you know, nine months to to just wow. get it open and just get a simple permit. And, and we reached out a number of times. We spoke to the councilman personally and he assured us that he would help us and we got no help you know, um, from that. And I'm glad to say that we're still setting the president of being successful and persevering through, um, you know, we got a citation from our new mayor at the time. He was our borough president for being a, a business who persevered through something hard to, to start a business and open it. And I'm happy that we got it. And I look at that citation, I'm looking at it now to understand mm-hmm. what we went through and to understand that we did persevere. Right. We did knuckle up and we did, you know, stand 10 toes down and we are doing something that our forefathers haven't done. And that's, you know, try to be successful, try to give back to the community and try to provide job accountability. Love it. Love it. Love it. Yeah. And Paul, what about you? Uh, I would say, you know, just to piggyback off of that, just like teamwork makes the dream work. Like it, it, like it really is. It really does take a village. I'm always encouraged, like you, even through the most challenging of times, like it's so funny. We could be having a challenging day, like dealing with, you know, dealing with any number of things. And then to hear somebody go, you know, after you, you know, fulfill their order and they go, I really like it here. I love coming here. I'm so glad you guys open because I, I, I had to. Like before, I had to go here to get this. I had to go to Manhattan to get this. And the fact that it's in the community, like I always wanted something like this here. And the fact that you guys are here, this is so great. Like just hearing that, aside from everything, of course, you want it to be successful monetarily. But then just to see the smile on somebody's face, on someone's face, that really does make it worth it. So just, you know, just the satisfaction of doing a good job. So I think that for me... Just so long as we're doing a good job and we're doing, you know, we're doing good, so to speak. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm more than happy with that, and I hope that we can continue to do that for years to come. Mm, I love it. And anything new? I know you all are doing a lot, and to say nothing is new is so okay. Um, but anything new that people can expect, or what does the future look like for you all? Uh, just continuing to run these locations and 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 uh, kind of spearheading the Sobel brand in Brooklyn. Again, you know we're the only, you know we're the only franchises that operate in this space. So you know typically you could follow us on social media. Our, our handles are on Instagram. We're at Sobel underscore Bedsty or the Williamsburg or Sobel underscore Williamsburg on um, Instagram. So you can check us out there, and we'll usually have. And we'll usually have any announcements of any events that we're going to be looking to do within the community. So we typically do things for like, you know, during the holidays or anything like that. We'll usually try to throw something, you know, just to get, you know, um, increase the community involvement, let you know that we're here and what specials that we're running. So that'll be the best place to check us out. Love it. And if someone is looking to connect with you all, um, how can they do that? Find you all and support you. Uh, they can find us on our uh, our Instagram. Um uh, Sobel underscore Bedstuy or Sobel underscore Williamsburg. Uh, they can ask any questions. They can ask for, hey, can you have Paul or can you have AJ reach out to me? And we'll reach back out because we're actively, you know, engaged on our social media. 
Love it. Well, Paul and AJ, thank you so much for being on the show. And again, thank you for all the work that you are doing and providing so much knowledge today. Wishing you all the luck and thank you again. No, thank you. Thank you so much for having us. Wasn't that a great conversation? So many aha moments, especially the ones about the napkins and the cups, me sharing my own personal experience with that, but really truly understanding what goes into operating a business, a physical location, the supplies, all of those things. So I just love how transparent AJ and Paul were about their journey and also about how despite the obstacles, They've continued to push and succeed and operate in excellence. So they own a business in New York, which is not an easy feat. And they are the definition of if you can make it in New York, you can make it anywhere. So whether you're in New York or another location, definitely solid advice that they are giving. And I also love that they stress the importance of knowing your numbers, having your paperwork in order and operating in excellence. So if this is the route that you want to go, all of these things are important to note and it might be a right fit for you if you are someone who wants to start a business, but like I said in the beginning, aren't sure about where to start or would rather use someone else's established business model to start your business idea. So such a great conversation. And of course, to find out more information about Sobo Brooklyn, about Paul and AJ, visit blacktobusiness.com forward slash 100 and be sure to give us a review and share this episode with a friend or someone who will find value in this conversation chat with you next week same time same place